everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea, and each week we come at you with announcements, some new music, some music news, talking about the world of music, and sometimes movies, and sometimes games. Indeed, and we have a few new releases we want to shout out, songs, albums, things that we've been listening to that we haven't had a chance to talk about yet, we're really excited about, really interested in, or just in general have thoughts on. And so let's lead off with one of the biggest music events, I suppose, of the last month or so, that being the new album from Andre 3000, New Blue Sun, Andre's flute album. He's uh, he's not back on the raps, no more raps. He's all about the flutes, all about the new age spiritual jazz, however you want to classify it. It's a dazzling and kind of confounding collection of music from an artist who has been consistently committed to expanding his horizons, expanding our conceptions of the kind of artist he is, even as far back as the late outcast days. Andre is across the spectrum of of artists who are widely recognized in popular media. He is one of the most restlessly, relentlessly original and in every way, shape, or form. Someone who came to fame with a style, a sound, and a set of skills, a very particular set of skills, that completely captivated audiences across the world and then chose not to lean into those skills, but to continue expanding his skill set outside of rap to basically do what every artist dreams of, to be able to you know, become an actor, become step into all these different realms and uh, find success in, in doing so. And New Blue Sun, his new flute album, may well be the most outlandish example of that yet. It is a colossal collection of chill jams. Uh, Jake, what are your thoughts on Andre 3000's new direction? Well, like the vast majority of the internet, finding out that this was in fact a real thing that was happening that was just kind of dropped in our laps was a bit sudden and confusing but honestly when you look at it from like a macro perspective it's not all that shocking like i'm pretty sure one of the most notable things he's been doing in the past couple of years aside from acting which he's very good at for the record i mean i i really like him in movies like claire denis high life for instance But, like, he's just kind of seen throughout, like, California playing the flute occasionally. So when you keep that in mind, it's like, oh, okay. I mean, I guess this is a logical progression of uh, his interest in that. And listening to this was interesting just because I went at it about a week after it dropped. So opinions were already starting to settle. And it was interesting because initially the first wave of people that responded to this seemingly really met this halfway and were like, wow, this is really different. And even though Andre is not rapping, uh, I really like this. And I think it's a really interesting direction. And I hope he makes more music like this. And then immediately after that, you have a wave of people coming and be like, this is boring. And so naturally I was like, okay, let's see what camp I fall into. And overall, I like it. It's, again, as you alluded to, it's a bit confounding, frankly. I mean, for multiple reasons, other than the fact that it is a 90-minute, heavily improvisational, flute-based jazz album, uh, but also because of the incredible song titles on here, like that night in Hawaii when I turned into a panther and started making these low-register purring tones that I couldn't control, ellipsis shit was wild, or uh, my personal favorite, Gandhi, Dalai Lama, your lord and savior JC, slash Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, and John Wayne Gacy. Um, This is an album that reminded me of a whole lot of different things. Uh, I think one key aspect is that I feel like Andre is a big appreciator of one Mr. Philip Glass. That was one aspect of this project that I kept listening to. And I kept getting multiple like that and maybe even like some more like left of the dial sort of electronic musicians, because there's a lot of this here that feels in very, very subtle ways, slightly manipulated to kind of, I guess, patch over a lot of the improvisational stuff, which largely is compelling in the moment. 
But when I pull back from it, I won't lie. I, I think it's, you know, it is a cool set of instrumental jams with some very exceptional playing on here. Uh, and it's produced quite well. But I wonder how much of this, like how much the players in question had guidelines for like, certain melodies certain progressions and whatnot just because the improvisational aspects of it i feel like do kind of let it down a little bit to the point where it's not a matter of this being like too long it's just that a lot of these songs feel sedate or sedentary for large portions of it and then they don't really develop they just kind of dissolve into something else uh if not just end outright and then go to another uh uh, another song entirely. So, I mean, I enjoyed this, but I think I'm really more interested in the idea of Andre perhaps building upon it and doing something a bit different, just because this does feel like, again, everything about it in terms of its construction feels very skillful, but simultaneously it all does feel like it's like meshed together in a way that feels just a teensy bit sloppy to me and i would like to see how he could refine this and potentially you know weave it into some tighter compositions maybe but you know as is it's a very nice vibey way to spend 90 minutes but i can't say that it left a huge impression on me like i would have liked for it to yeah i came away feeling similarly I don't know if underwhelmed is the right word because it just it I didn't have I had a I knew to adjust my expectations for what this was going to be, um, but yeah. approaching it on its own merits, it's a a really interesting collection of musical environments. Uh, I would and I I would stress that because I don't really think that there are compositions in the sense that there is music with that progresses and any kind of traditional sense it is more about establishing an environment through you know a, a dense mix of instrumentation and kind of letting you kind of sit in that environment for a while i uh, feel it kind of breathing you know in that sense it shares a lot of similarities with some of the early records of tangerine dream and the biggest artist that has mm -hmm. come up in the conversation in terms of musical similarities that being john hassel who uh, recently departed legendary figure in the world of ambient music in the 70s close collaborator with artists like brian eno and harold budd but someone who compared to them was much more interested in the sort of um real environmental aspects of 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 how to construct these soundscapes and really kind of a natural environment specifically like how you could build these use this organic and use this traditional instrumentation essentially to construct stuff that felt like it was from an alien planet essentially or from the rainforest or from a kind of ancient time and that feeling comes through in this record a lot um some really interesting collaborations on this as well uh one of the biggest collaborations is uh session guitarist nate mercero who's really made a name for himself in recent years had quite some success contributing with major pop artists as well but is also just a really interesting uh performer in his own right worked with and, rustin kelly this year on his yes. album that we reviewed favorably one thing that's striking about this as well is for all of the hubbub about it being andre 3000's flute album it's not like you're hearing the flute all the time. You you hear it a lot, no. um, but there are significant stretches of this record where you're really just listening to a bedrock of synthesizers and guitars, often very processed guitars. Again, shout out Nate Mercero, and you know an array of jazz instrumentation that is, yeah, again primarily in the woodwind space. But uh, there's a lot of synthetics on here. Um, and a lot of stuff that isn't a flute, basically. And um, it's, it is setting a stage for Andre's performance, but I feel like he he sees himself as a part of the fabric of the music, more so as the star of the show. Um, so that's interesting. Um, it, 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 it surprised me in that sense, that it was a much more of a traditionally collaborative style jazz record than, you know, just exercises with the flute. Uh, so I think, yeah, I, I admire it deeply, um, even though I think that its length is, is unwieldy and 
puts me off wanting to revisit it. I also admire the length of it as an extension of the boldness of the statement in the first place. I am Andre 3000. I am putting out my debut solo full-length album. It contains no rapping, and it is 90 minutes long. Like, the 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 full vision of that, I think, is is bold and sharp, and I admire it, and I admire the way that he's committed to the excess in every area. It is just a record that is rather taxing. There were moments like Bipolar Disorder's Daughter. That song reminded me of like the water level on like an eight, like a 80s sort of uh, classic Nintendo game or something. Yeah. Um, and uh, I thought that the first and final pieces on the record as well were really striking. Yeah, I, I thought it was good overall. I just, it is the kind of thing that for Andre, I'm sure is a really personal and meaningful and 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 carefully crafted artistic statement but from an outside perspective also kind of feels as though the point of it is largely reached and made before the music even starts uh, and so i think the, yeah. the, the record itself kind of suffers as a result of that next thing i want to talk about is that there's a new song out from bjork who's teamed up with rosalia on this new song oral which is actually a song that they released to protest Icelandic fish farming. And it's actually a song that Björk wrote apparently in the 90s, but never released. And so this is one that's been in the vault for a long time. She's brought on Rosalia to kind of contribute towards it. And it's turned into this full-blown collaboration. It's an incredible song. I think it's one of my favorite songs that Björk has released in some time. And we were really big fans of her last album, Fosora, as well. So there's no... Um, it's not for lack of competition, but this song I thought was incredible. There's a beautiful presence of uh, strings on this song as well, particularly these kind of really lumbering horns, which remind me a little bit of um, Bon the Cure era Bjork as well. Yep. But again, matched with the sensibilities of Rosalia as well, in the sense that there's a bit of reggaeton coming through in this as well. It really is like a full on 50 50 collaboration in the way that it plays. Um, what do you guys think of this song? I think the song is fantastic, which is, you know, no surprise coming from me. I, I love Fasora, top three Bjork album, IMO. But this honestly only resembles her more recent sounds very tangentially. Kind of like Riley implied, there's a lot of elements of stuff like Volna Kyrick. I feel like almost the entire last decade of her music is kind of jammed into here in one way or another, and it doesn't sound like messy or weird. In fact, I kind of like how Rosalia acts as a bit of a counterpoint to kind of tether the song back to earth. And really, if anything, it just makes me be like, I haven't heard any of Rosalia's three albums, which I have basically been assured by most people I know that all three of them are excellent in some way or another. So I really need to to check those out. Uh, and I'm just, I, I hope that, I mean, it's probably just because it's a one-off single and because it's a song that was made a long time ago. But like, if Bjork made an album that entirely sounded like this, hell yeah, dude, that would rule. Because Fasora is an album that is like, really centered around its rhythmic ideas. Whereas here, it's again, it's a bit more of a 50-50 split between melodies and rhythms that take a little bit more of a backseat. So if this is a direction for her music in the future, cool. If it's just a one-off single, it's a great fucking single. Mm, absolutely. I mean, Rosalia has just gone from strength to strength. Uh, massive, massive fan. Uh, her last album, Motomami, even though it was quite a departure, from the records previous to it was one of the ones albums I came back to the most throughout 2022. It really, really grew on me. Um, she's just massively talented and it's a, it's a fantastic collaboration. Dua Lipa has a new song out. It's called Houdini. It's okay. It's good. It's, I, I thought it was, a, I thought, I think it's a decent song. The thing that stands out to me the most about it is how it seems like coming off the back of future nostalgia, which is a massive pop record in 2020 it seems as though Dua Lipa is keen to more and more lean into the kind of new disco that artists like Jesse Ware are finding success with. Um, and kind of, cause, cause someone like Jesse Ware is like immensely popular with a very particular audience, you know, with, with queer people, with, with people online, Thug but she A's. hasn't really had, she hasn't really had like the kind of radio success that, that you would expect from an artist who's delivering pop music at her caliber. So it feels like maybe Dua Leap is going to be the, well, maybe her aim is to kind of bring that um, to the radio. Uh, she's not as good at it as Jessie Weir. And 
this is the thing with with Dua Lipa. I'm honestly not a huge fan. I didn't dislike Future Nostalgia. We never got to talk about it, really. It came out before we started the podcast. Not that long before, but we just never really got to talk like about it. Like two months. There's some jams on it. like, yeah. And I'm not going to take away from the fact that, you know, songs like Levitating and whatever are, you know, really catchy. And you could find a lot worse to be as successful as that was. But I've just never really got got it with, with Dua Lipa. I've never really, like, been invested in her as a personality musically she's kind of just never quite hit that you know, she's never quite connected with me in a way that you know a lot of pop stars doing the kind of music that she's doing typically would i don't know how do you guys feel about doula peep i'm very much in the same ballpark as you when it comes to doula lipa as somebody who like i want to like her a lot more than I do because again Future Nostalgia is a very good album for the record I just think that that album is front loaded as fuck like those first like five or so songs on there are great that would be like an all timer pop EP back half of the album not so much honestly uh, that said I, li- I remember you know jamming out to physical during quarantine so I have a bit of a nostalgic haha attachment to some of those singles but again as like a presence there's not a lot that I can you know it- it's difficult to sort of pick out of a lineup what makes Dua Lipa special and so when it was announced that she was going to be working with Kevin Parker of Tame Impala on her next album which is supposed to be slated for next year on the one hand I'm like okay this could be awesome because, you know, Kevin Parker got a really distinct kind of uh, production style. Uh, you know, th- th- this could meld in a very interesting way and could give her sound a, a bit of a unique edge that could really d- distinguish her from the rest of the pack. And the unfortunate reality of uh, Houdini is that it also it's like it's trying to like there are parts of it that sound Kevin Parker-ish, like there's a guitar part near the end that sounds like it could fit on a Tame Impala song, and the drums, generally speaking, do kind of sound like they have the same amount of body and weight, but this song abandons one of Dua Lipa's greatest strengths, which is hook writing. I don't really have an identifiable hook, either instrumentally or lyrically or vocally, and that to me is just like, it's a bizarre choice for a single, frankly. Like, I'm not even sure how it would work in the context of maybe being a deeper album cut, because it's a bit like the progression is a bit kind of stolid, frankly. Like, it's it's not a bad song, but I just don't really feel either way about it. It, it lacks the flavor of the greater songs on Future Nostalgia, and it's kind of worrying just because I feel like it could have gone one of two ways with her next album. I'm saying this like it's already out, but, you know, I would love to be proven wrong in that teaming up with Tame Impala to produce your next album will either result in an emotion situation where you appeal to all of the indie pitchfork music hipster crowd and your album ends up super underperforming but ends up being like a huge cold classic or you could just kind of pivot away from that and try to you know play with the times kind of fit into an established trend so that you you know continue your upward trajectory and it feels like the latter half is what she's going for here but without a lot of the joie de vivre of those like amazing hooks and you know great dance beat shit from before so i'm i'm a bit disappointingly tepid on it frankly she's like weirdly bad at delivering emphatic vocals to be honest like i i, I kind of hate i don't hate it's not a bad song but i kind of hate levitating to be honest with you it's I was going to say, this is why my favorite Dua Lipa song is Physical, because that hook is iron fucking clad. That's a good song. I like the one, I Don't Start Now, I think that one's pretty good too. That, um, that's good too. But the thing with Levitating is just like, the vocal cadence in that song is so weird to me. Who oh, you? You want me, baby? I'm levitating. It's a bit it's like, light. It's very strange. Like, the, the instrumental is the star and, of that song. And like, I get she's trying to fit a particular rhythm, but it just kind of sounds like someone who's just like... <laughs> <laughs> I, I just like the the background instrumental the blom 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 and i'm like what the fuck is this shit let's move on new song from beyonce my house which as soon as there was a new song 
called My House from Beyonce, I've been all morning singing to myself, Beyonce is playing at my house, my house. <laughs> um, anyway, oh, God. this song is hard as shit. Uh, very much befitting. Banger. Very much befitting the Renaissance era that it's coming out of. Of course, it is the it is the sole original song from Beyonce's new Renaissance movie. She's back to rapping her ass off on this thing, and not just rapping her ass off as well, but but a bitch is mad. She's like, what I love about it is it's like it's she has this genuinely fiery rage in her performance, but like the point of the song is just that she wants you to dance. So it's like someone really aggressively telling you to dance, not just like, you know, but like, like they're going to fucking kill you if you don't dance your ass off. I, I love the weird mismatch there between the level of aggression and the thing that she wants you to do. It's really amusing. And the song is just really hard. It's got like a Southern hip hop flavor, like a dirty South kind of thing going on. And like, again, I love, when Beyonce just really puts the stank on her songs real hard, which is why Renaissance is, oh God, you know, I, I would really have to do some soul searching to figure out what my favorite Beyonce album is. But that's one of the reasons I enjoyed Renaissance as much as I did. Uh, but this is, I mean, just like, it, it's nice to know that there are pop stars that are big enough that like a throwaway single song that's probably a b-side from their last album can come out and then it's just like wow this is fucking fantastic and it's no business being this good i mean but that's the thing is that beyonce is like is so big and so powerful and now that the renaissance movie is a big a big deal we've got her just like in her continuing her imperial era which has never really ended frankly i mean like she left destiny's child and then just became the biggest pop star in the universe yeah. but regardless uh, I, I love that this can just happen, that she can just drop a random loose single and it can just be like one of my favorite things she's made in a while. So hell yeah, man. Was, wasn't really until Lemonade that this kind of kicked in. But ever since then, her artistic persona has been just this righteously furious human being. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, in Lemonade, that was all wrapped up in the kind of personal life you know uh narrative that that album was 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 wrapped up in um but it's interesting the way that it's persisted into basically everything that she's done since then she's kind of firmly established herself in this like just this just this fucking ferocious mode it's really unique i think for and obviously beyonce is a unique pop star but but even you know even if she were just on, on the same level of success as, as any other major pop star it would still be really unique to have someone whose persona and whose self-presentation and whose attitude was as aggressive as Beyonce's. It's, it's just, it's really one of the most appealing things about the current mode that she's in and the mode she's been in for, you know, coming up on a decade. That's, I think, really, really awesome. And also, we're you know, this month, we're coming up on the 10-year anniversary of her self-titled record as well, which is a huge moment. Right in music for the 21st century so far just in terms of of the impact that record had and the method means of its release and and all of that sort of stuff as well so as much as the renaissance movie is a celebration of this ferocious era of of, of house music that um beyonce is firmly rooted in now it's also you know a, a good excuse to go back and think about the scale of her domination i think about that quite frequently my only thought is really that if ever I host a party from now on, that'll be the song that this will be the song that I play <laughs> when it is time for the party to end. Get the fuck up out my house. Get the fuck up out my house. Longtime guitarist of Killing Joke, Geordie Walker, passed away this week. Killing Joke, a massively influential and long-lasting band who managed to persist beyond their early era as a kind of gothic industrial pop band in the wake of post-punk through into the 90s and 2000s and 2010s releasing urgent and innovative and interesting records that kept them successful and famous and critically well-regarded as well so a, a, a massively 
successful and enduring band that have endure, endured well beyond the odds and for a period much longer than most bands from that era have stayed both relevant and interesting. I'm familiar with Killing Jerk because their 1985 album Nighttime, which is probably their most famous album, uh, is a record that my dad loves a lot. Um, and songs like the title track on that record and one of their biggest songs, Love Like Blood as well, are massively enduring songs. 80s as well. It's a fantastic song. That's a really, really strong record. But Jake, I know that they've kind of been an artist that you've never really gotten around to until this week as well. I'm curious about what your thoughts are on Killing Joke and on uh, Geordie as a guitarist, specifically on the back of what you've heard. As is often the case with artists that pass away, uh, unfortunately, this was the excuse that I had to get into Killing Joke, which is a band that I've always had on my radar just because, I mean, like, I love industrial rock and industrial metal. I love post-punk and I love gothic shit. And Killing Joke are all of those things. Uh, and honestly, you don't really have a shortage of great albums to choose from. Their catalog is like insanely respectable and their longevity is incredible. I mean, the self-titled came out in 1980 and they've been making records ever since. And frankly, they've never really dropped the ball in a hugely significant way from what I can tell. But that said... Uh, I went and used this opportunity to explore the second self-titled album they have, the one from 2003, which is considered a bit of a reinvention of their sound somewhat, at least slightly. I guess you could kind of call it a comeback album, considering it was like seven or eight years uh, apart from whatever their last record was. And this is way more of a foray into industrial rock and metal in like a heavier sense. It's It has some of those post-punk affectations, especially when it comes to the lead singer, but it is overridingly an industrial metal album god i loved it i loved it it was it's one of those things that i loved so much where i was just like i just i fucking hate myself for putting off getting into these guys sooner just because it contains all of the you know the aesthetic signifiers of stuff that i like it's got this really like the lead singer of killing joke is incredible because he's got that very kind of traditional sort of disaffected post-punky voice but also on this album i don't know if this is the case on their other ones but like he has this guttural bellow when he gets like really fucking angry and that's like half of the delivery on here which is just like mesmerizing to listen to i haven't really seen or heard i guess i haven't heard anybody who's employed their vocals in such a stark way in a very long time I mean, this is very much a derivative of bands like Nine Inch Nails and stuff like that, even, but it, it, a little bit heavier than that, a little bit more off the deep end. I mean, I thought about things like Strapping Young Lad pretty frequently when listening to something like this. There are songs on here that still kind of retain their sort of gothic post-punk energy, like um, You'll Never Get to Me, which I mean, straight up is an industrial uh, disintegration era cure song uh, but one aspect of this album that I really didn't expect was the fact that this is a very political album this is an album that I mean this is the, these fellas are not fans of Mr. George Bush and Mr. Tony Blair uh, and it does not take a lot of listening to to glean that from it but all of it's very righteous very powerful very angry in the way you want like great punk music to be first song on here the death and resurrection show is just this orgiastic display of amazing industrial atmospheric shit but with heavy pummeling riffs and huge drum fills and i mean there's also blood on your hands uh you'll never get to me is actually kind of like really inspiring there's a very uh active sort of um sentiment of you know resistance and perseverance throughout that one that was like kind of unexpectedly uplifting i suppose um just a a great album to listen to if you want to feel really angry about shit and you know fight the power etc but yeah this is fantastic and i can't wait to listen to other killing joke albums because if they're even like slightly like this in any respect and i've listened to requiem off of the self-titled which is amazing so yeah killing joke amazing band uh huge staggering loss everybody who was a part of this is so clearly felt in the final product of their music it's a another quintessential example of a band where it seems like everybody played a very pivotal role in their sound oh and one of the most fucking striking things about this album that i had 
absolutely no idea is that on the 2003 self-titled, you have Dave fucking Grohl on the drums. Fuck yeah, man. Like, again, fills across the board. Phenomenal. And also production from uh, one Mr. Andy Gill of Gang of Four. It's an amazing sounding album. I mean, just like all around full marks, an incredible record. Go check it out. I only really have experience with the song 80s, which I think was put on my radar from the fact that it's uh, such a supposed come as you are inspiration, which I definitely hear. But uh, like the songs are so wildly different Mm -hmm. that it it never bared any real weight for me. But that song is magnificent, Um, in particular, Jordy's guitar work on that song which really brings it roaring to life and it's i mean yeah it just even just that riff alone is like you have a place in the in the hall of fame of 80s guitar work Mm. so i can't even imagine how rewarding diving into that discography would be yeah yeah that is the the last song on nighttime and it really packs a punch um and as for the come as you are i think i think part of that is a Prior to the fact that yeah, yeah, it is kind of the same rhythm as Come As You Are. It's just pitched differently and it's a lot faster. Um, but also it's a product of the fact that Kurt Cobain was a huge avowed fan of the band and shouted them out on multiple occasions, which you can understand when you listen to their music as well. Like 80s killing joke. I can't it, it, I can't speak for the more modern stuff because I haven't heard it. But like in the 80s, it was like it's like pornography era the cure except like if it had the uh, immediate sensibilities of like 90s era the cure it's like a weird Mm. like pornography era the cure meets like violator era depeche mode like it's just fucking sick that album sucks jake you got anything that you want to shout out that we haven't talked about yet that you've been listening to recently or that you're excited about Two things I will shout out here is that I have been catching up with the band Imperial Triumphant recently because, uh, I mean, listeners, longtime listeners especially, might know that they're a band we've brought up rather frequently um, just because the two albums that they've released this decade, Alphaville and Spirit of Ecstasy, are two of the best metal releases of the decade, frankly. Um, I adore both of them, uh, in particular Alphaville, but I mean, Spirit of Ecstasy is basically just as good. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that said, uh, they are, they've come to be sort of one of my favorite modern metal bands. Uh, and what they've been doing over the course of the past couple of months is releasing immensely unconventional covers of songs that you in a million years wouldn't picture a normal black metal band uh, trying to cover, let alone the avant-garde black metal jazz fusion shit that Imperial Triumphant do. Uh, So naturally, when they released their first cover, which is a cover of Radiohead's Paranoid Android, I could only go, huh? And then I listened to it and I was like, you know, I would only barely be able to tell that this is a cover of Paranoid Android just because the few lyrics you can make out and just the general structure of the song is so unmistakable and I've listened to the original so often but like if you gave this to only somebody who'd you know given a passing listen to something like OK Computer they would not know that this is a cover at all uh, and that's kind of why it's amazing like all of these covers that they've released are wholly transformative of the original songs which if you've seen our favorite song covers video you will know that we are a big fan of when these uh covers tend to fully sort of deconstruct and then reconstruct what these songs actually are it's the sign of a band you know taking their commitment full throttle and i loved the paranoid android uh cover but then they released four more after that uh a night in tunisia jacob's ladder motor breath and nefertiti and all of them slap. Uh, I Wait, think my favorite Motor thus far Breath, is... like me- the Metallica song. Yes, Motor Breath, the Metallica <laughs> song. Uh, <laughs> and it is an avant garde black metal version of these songs, but it still manages to like to copy the the structure and the broadest ideas of what these songs are and do, but still gives it the unmistakable Imperial Triumphant coat of paint. Like again, Motor Breath. Total fucking rager. Jacob's Ladder is probably my favorite thus far. Um, 
it's I mean, it's just it's like the proggiest thing that they've made, which I mean, again, you're covering Rush. That's probably like that's that's the way to go. And I mean, Motor Breath just kind of slaps, frankly. Uh, and the, the one I'm most impressed by, though, is Nefertiti, uh, which is like this absolutely insane like it's probably the most esoteric thing that they've made like there are elements of things like sound collage and music concrete here and it's it's bizarre like again they're they're a band who have always flirted with their jazz tendencies very very strongly but here it's just you can really tell that these guys have a love for all of the music that inspires them. Uh, and I feel like that was um, as apparent, apparent as early on as Alphaville, where that sort of ends with one of the bonus tracks being a cover of Happy Home, which is a, a phenomenal cover. But these are covers that I think people are finding somewhat alienating just because they don't seem to be received particularly well. But I feel like it's because they're so successful at fundamentally changing the song's DNA that people who are like, oh, I like Radiohead and I like Paranoid Android. There is no overlap between if you like this, then you'll also like this. I could imagine people who were fans of every single one of these songs hating all of these covers. But that's precisely why I think all of them kind of kick ass. So I'm hoping that maybe we'll get like a couple more or like one more and then we'll get like an EP released or something just because having these in one release would be particularly cool. But I just really go check these out. These are some of the most like fun I've had with music all year. They're they're bizarre. They're kind of beguiling. And I love them. We um, did a video last year. I think it was last year, like on cover songs that we liked more than the original. Mm -hmm. And in that video, I think we talked about or at least probably I talked about how like for me like if you're gonna cover a song or if you're gonna like release a song a cover of a song like and and you want it to be meaningful that you're covering the song you need to change it you need to like the the more yep. you to me i don't think there's more value in covers than when they recontextualize and reimagine the song in a really dramatic way and i think the idea of this avant-garde black metal band that have incorporated jazz into their music pretty prominently as well covering that particular miles davis piece as well which is one of his most beautiful pieces from that sort of pre uh fusion yes. 60s era uh, i i need to hear this i had no idea it existed um and, and the, yeah and i like that all of these covers are so are such radically different in their origin um these are very different songs very different songs uh, at least the ones i've heard as well i haven't heard one of them but the originals but um uh, that's so cool I, I hope they keep doing it that's awesome uh, all right let's get into the final topic of discussion today which is this new album from danny brown quaranta uh, which comes from as we learn in the opening seconds of the record the italian word for 40 it's also in spirit a sequel album to his breakthrough record 2011's triple x an album which was largely conceptually based around danny turning 30 and the state of his life at that time that is still one of danny's most beloved successful famous and chaotic albums it's a really funny record it's also a really upsetting record it's got a lot of, of wild emotional impact and ridiculous irreverence to it i think in a lot of ways even though most younger audiences and people at our age typically probably were introduced to danny with atrocity exhibition will regard that as his masterpiece and i probably think that's his best album as well in a lot of ways i think triple x is the most definitive album in terms of the full spectrum of who danny brown is the the relentless chaos of his personality the absolutely bizarro world that he existed in when he was coming up, the, the places he was at, you know, the the darkness he was going through, and the, the, the sort of personality he put forward, largely in terms of the performance style, but also in terms of the, the style of his writing, the, the, the way that he blended this really silly, puerile, very sexually aggressive uh writing with this gravity altering subject matter that record is so is such a juggernaut in terms of um sort of hip-hop solo breakthrough albums 
and I mention it, I, I labor it only because Quaranta is for Danny at 40 what Triple X was for Danny at 30. And he wanted to release this album two years ago, you know, in time for the 10th anniversary of Triple X. This album was kind of in label hell for a while. And Danny was really struggling to get it released. He's 42 now, I think, 42 or 43. So its original kind of conceptual identity as a snapshot of Danny at 40 has kind of been lost a little bit. But what it is, like Triple X, is it is an honest and uncompromising portrait of the place that Danny is at in his life. And I think this is important to emphasize prior to any conversation about it, because it is a radically different album to really anything Danny's ever done before. Even the collaboration with JPEG Mafia earlier this year, Scaring the Hose, was much more akin to the sort of thing we would expect from Danny than what this album is. This is a sobering album. It is frank and uncouth. It is a restrained and at points sentimental and hushed subtle record that is really disarming in how straightforward it is for an artist like Danny and and for the sorts of things that we know him for the associations we have with him especially if you view him through the light of oh he's the atrocity exhibition guy or even the triple x guy or the old guy or the you know what I'm saying guy if there's some really younger people who know him from that album um, or the skier in the hose guy. You know, Danny has a very particular image of this sort of cartoonish personality that Quaranta, at practically every turn, bucks against very strongly. Jake, I'm curious what your thoughts were, thoughts thoughts are on this album being so radically different and stripped back and direct in a new way for Danny. What do you think about this album? I, of course, was anticipating this album uh, greatly just because I'm a big fan of Danny Brown, uh, but also because I feel like Atrocity Exhibition is like, it's, you know, far from his only great and even like excellent album, but it's the only album of his where I've like really forged kind of a deep connection with it. So I was interested to see where he would go. But at the same time, I was a little bit worried leading up to this because, you know, as we've mentioned before, Riley and I weren't as big on Scare in the Hose as the rest of the internet were. I still really like that album, but I kind of view it more as a novelty than an actual record. Like it's it's a fun time, but the 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 huge like appreciation for it just kind of eludes me. And the biggest complaint I think that we both shared with that album is that it really felt like Danny was A, taking a very hard backseat and B, when he did show up, he wasn't really giving it what we viewed to be his best, uh, in our opinion. And I was like, you know, this is maybe he's just displaying a different kind of, of mode or tonality for working with JPEG Mafia. Uh, and maybe his next album will be more of a return to form. And then uh, the single Tantor came out, which is a great song, uh, still a great song. I, I loved it. But it also like it sounds like the Danny Brown that you're used to. And when you see things like what this album is supposed to be about for him contextually and like the cover and whatnot, like aesthetically, it's presenting itself as being a more contemplative kind of internal, not necessarily laid back, but I guess like more subtle record. And Tantor is not that at all. It's a big, loud song with big, loud drums. It's a very much a Danny Brown type beat song. Again, I love it. That's not a bad thing. But I was also like, is this album going to commit to what it is? And the answer, resoundingly for me, is yes. Uh, I, I think this is an outstanding album. Honestly, I think this is my second favorite Danny Brown, Danny Brown project in general. It's 11 tracks. It's 35 minutes long. Uh, and it feels like not a second of it is wasted. You do get moments like Tantor that I feel like a lot of Danny Brown fans, you know, if you're coming to his music for a particular thing, this is probably what that particular thing is. And you get it. But for the most part, this is Danny in a very different kind of mode. And it's a mode that I've kind of been 
wanting him to explore. There have been shades of, you know, more self-interrogative stuff as far back as a trusty exhibition. And uh, you know what I'm saying. But on here, we get some of his most personal, most affecting and most story driven tracks. Uh, one of the particular highlights for me is actually the closer bass jam, which is a really kind of nostalgic walk back through Danny's past. Uh, that reminded me a lot of songs on, not like sound wise, but at least in how emotionally they made me feel like the some of the songs on the latter half of the Jid album from last year, The Forever Story, where you see both of these rappers sort of pontificating on what led them there. But Danny in particular is focused on sort of the contradictory of being where he's at right now as a human being and as an artist. Uh, one of the most distinct lines on here. Uh, that really stuck with me is this rap shit done saved my life but fucked it up at the same time and basically every single song is an exploration of this contradiction and how this is this thing that has fulfilled him satisfied him brought him up made him famous and also has you know deepened his issues has made him struggle more with his addiction has you know put him in a weird place where people are expecting certain things from him and he doesn't want to abide by those expectations and i feel like he you know illustrates his points really really well there are songs on here that feature uh mike for instance like on the song celibate one of my favorite songs on here uh down with it another huge highlight for me are songs that have really unconventional beats uh like the latter of which i actually compared to being like this sounds like a uh a sort of ambient pop instrumental that sounds like something like david sylvian would have made uh which again not at all something i would have expected on a danny brown album but still something that i feel like feels as unique as he has always been really he's just channeling it into a different form uh, and as a performer, I feel like his subtler, more nuanced side comes through here really, really well. This is the most kind of involved I've been in the personal narrative of Danny Brown. Uh, and as a result, there are songs on here that just kind of really kind of just hit me in the gut. Uh, Dark Sword Angel, for instance, um, even uh, Hanami, the penultimate track. Uh, and then there are his musings on things like... Um, uh, gentrification with uh, the amazingly titled Jen's Terrific Vacation. Uh, one of my favorite Danny Brown songs, honestly, the, the way he ties his personal narrative into the narrative of gentrification of this place that he came from, that he's now observing as a more storied artist and coming back from, kind of reminds me of somebody like, you know, Kendrick Lamar on To Pimp a Butterfly, you know, talking about, you know, how success has altered his worldview and then going back to the place in which he came from and how alienated he feels from it. And that's more or less the case here. It, it's Danny at his most incisive, his most cutting, and arguably his, his most emotional. This record, I think, pre presents a side of Danny in terms of the sober reflection that you've get in glimpses on his previous records but that he's never delivered with as much detail and commitment as he does here like that particular introspection which a lot of the times feels like you're listening to him speak to a therapist is the full identity of this album and a certain level it can be off-putting that a lot of what Danny is best at doing is stuff that he tries to avoid on this album Tantor I think being a notable exception but then from an artistic perspective as well Coranta like the Andre 3000 album becomes more admirable because it is Danny not only not relying on certain crutches that he has as a performer certain aspects of his of his persona and certain skills that he has that have drawn people to him not only is he not relying on those for large swathes of this album he's disregarding them entirely and he's just being very frank and those aspects of the record i think while being in some ways the least satisfying for me as a danny brown fan because it feels as though he's shearing off a lot of what makes him a unique and and standout performer are also things that make the record easier to connect to on an emotional level and, and feel distinct and new and courageous for Danny. And so I'm in a strange place where I think those aspects of the record in songs like Down With It, for instance, where he reflects on how the experience of being famous 
has cr turned him into this paranoid person who can't trust anyone, who's been betrayed too many times, and whose paranoia ultimately leads him to shut out and lose one of the most important people in his life, a person who he hints at on a different point of the record he was engaged to. I don't know what it is, whether it's the delivery, the performance, even though Danny has been really frank about his life before, there's something strangely discomforting about hearing him talk to this person in such a way. And it's weird, right? Because there's been previous albums where Danny has sort of talked about su having suicidal thoughts and, and overdosing and all these kinds of other really personal, you know, brutal things that have happened to him. And it kind of just feels like part of the course, you know, part of the artistic experience with Danny. And yet somehow hearing him talk about a relationship falling apart, something much more, a much more mundane form of having your life essentially thrown out of balance. There's something about that that feels more discomforting um, from Danny, and it's a, a weird experience in a, in a good way, in a positive way. I think it's a really good record, despite how mostly said it and tonally withdrawn it is. I think there are a few moments of, of genuinely interesting and surprising production and experimentation i think the song ybp in particular is a standout in that regard that's honestly one of my favorites on the record i actually agree with you jake that bass jam the closing song on this record is one of the strongest moments it is actually my favorite song on the album too mine too uh, one of two collaborations with Paul White, one of his most regular producers, the guy who produced all of Atrocity Exhibition, and someone that he's really formed a strong creative partnership with. But this song is just so arresting because I don't know if I've ever, at least if I can ever remember Danny rapping about his childhood. Because Danny's someone who, I mean, this is an album that talks a lot about how the chaos of the past is where that has put you basically and how unmoored and unprepared for the realities of a, of a mature, stable existence that lifestyle leaves you. But I've never heard Danny go this far back. I've never heard Danny do something as simple as talking about listening to music with his mother as a kid, something so simple that you can tell was such a pivotal childhood experience that led him in many ways to where he is today and all of the things that he's been through the connection that he and his mother in particular formed over music and um it feels like it's the most hard-hitting moment on the entire album for me and just how much of a radical step backwards it is and it's a beautiful muted bass jam instrumental as well the song's title basically tells you how it sounds and those moments, I think, of, of genuinely arresting minimalism are the things that stand out to me the most about this album. In some ways, I wish it kind of committed to that even more, but then I'd be in an awkward position of being like, it would have even less of what I typically love about Danny. So I'll say this. I have very positive feelings on it. I think it's a really good album. I think I appreciate it most in terms of how it sort of resets the dial for Danny, how it kind of gives you a portrait of where he's at that feels distinct and different and really current in a way that something like scaring the hose didn't feel um but i mean admittedly because it wasn't going for that but there's an emotional honesty that comes through without trying to be melodramatic and that's the thing is that danny's very good at being emotionally honest he's done that a lot in the past but usually he does it through theatricality through exaggeration through his ridiculous over-the-top style of performance that's an emotional truth to his experience right of the life that he's lived where it has been like that but to hear him deliver raps and and performances that are equally as honest but in a very different mode for him uh is you know it's refreshing and it's uncompromising and it's bold. It's a sort of step backwards and introspection that every great artist gets to at some point in their career after a certain level of success for a certain amount of time. And the prevailing thing that comes through on this record is just how thankful Danny is to be alive. And it's a powerful feeling uh, to, to really feel that, to really be able to tell how grateful he is 
despite all the problems that he still has, despite all of the ways in which he's flawed and struggling to adjust to his life, even with all of the privilege and um, fortune and things that he's afforded, that it all comes back to just being grateful to be alive. Let us know what you think of the new record from Danny Brown, Andre 2000, or any of the other music we've talked about today in the comments below. What have you been listening to? What should we listen to? Let us know, and we can make it a part of future Now episodes. This will be the last Now episode of the year because we're about to go into list season, but we do, we do have a video coming up on our favorite video game soundtracks that we're actually about to record, and we also have reviews of new albums from Panopticon and Peter Gabriel, as well as our year-end list videos coming very soon, so stick around. It's going to be a really fun December. Until next time, though, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Adidas, impossible is nothing.